All right, Mish Schneider, Chief Strategist at Market Gauge. Uh, Mish, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing good. How about yourselves? We are doing well. So we're kind of, it feels like, at this inflection point in the market right now. Uh, and a lot of people are pointing to a lot of the leaders giving up some uh, some gains here, whether that be NVIDIA, Apple, et cetera. But from what I understand, you're watching a lot of the of the sectors that haven't been making new highs, whether that be regional banks, transportation, retail. What are you seeing there? Well, what's been so interesting is through this whole tech rally and all time highs that we made, I think a record, almost a record time of 44 times new all time highs in the course of this year, we've had really basically nothing from those areas other than the fact that they have held up. When I say hold up, I mean they haven't exactly collapsed to a point that has been critical, but yet they have underperformed so grossly that at this point now with Nasdaq finally taking a little bit of a pause, you have to say, what is the market waiting for and what does it mean? for these areas, for the market, for the economy, for the Federal Reserve, for geopolitics, all of that. And I think that's why right now it's so key to be looking at the small caps, the transportation, the regional banks and the retail. These are really the inside US centric areas of the market, right? So small caps, there's buying coming in every time it gets down to around 198. If you're looking at IWM, it's sitting here right before the opening between 200 and 201. Through 202, that starts to look interesting. But if it breaks down under 198, mm, trouble. Same thing with retail, our good old granny retail, XRT, hanging out, trying so hard to hold on to about the 75 level, gives it up. You got to wonder what does that mean for the consumer? If you look at transportation, that's been probably the weakest uh, of all of them besides maybe regional banks. What does that mean? Why aren't things moving robustly? Why is the, the, you know, all of the freight across the country not necessarily really performing well with all this stuff about growth, 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 growth? And then the regional banks, of course, there's been reports, very quiet, about some commercial banks and commercial real estate that are having some trouble and getting downgraded. And that's another one that's been sitting. So they're all sitting right on life support. And I think that makes this week very critical. Forgetting about PCE and all of that, just looking right at that. If it holds here, buying comes in, we might see more rotation, but, and I don't think it's gonna be negative for growth. It just means that we'll see more money coming into these areas. And if they collapse, I would wonder what that means. And I think, you know, stagflation's still on the table because of geopolitics and weather. Now we're getting into a real seasonal bad period, not just in the United States, but there's still drought. Or geopolitics, because even though they sought to take a back burner, they're still out there. And I think it'll either be that or recession will start to come back on the table again. And we don't know. I don't think anybody really knows right here. Misha, just I want to go back to uh, you talked about uh, recession, the bonds. I mean, we are really at an interesting point here in the market. I mean, it seems like we always like, oh, well, mm, we're not going to worry about inflation and interest rates right now. We're just going to focus on how great AI is going to make our society and more efficient and be great for every company and every human being. But there's a lot of negatives out here. I mean, but you know, the bonds, the bonds are telling you that interest rate, you know, are not coming down really anytime soon. And there's also other factors. Look, look at the geopolitical factors. Look at the climate factors. Look at look at crude. I mean, you know, you could go the recession look, but if you wanted to be a worry wart, you could be more in the stagflation camp. Where are you at? You just said it perfectly. I mean, I don't really know. I'm still more in the stagflation camp for a couple of reasons. One, besides the fact of what you just mentioned with geopolitics and weather, and those are real factors. One thing that we're learning about AI and this surge in AI and data centers is that the demand for energy keeps increasing. And right now we're at about uh, AI and data centers take up about 3% of the uh energy usage. They're projecting it to go to 19% by 2028. And this energy has to come from somewhere. And even though we know 
that they're trying to figure out how to use cleaner energy. There was a whole story last week about geothermals, which is kind of an interesting concept, but not perfect. Definitely clean, but not perfect. We're still going through the traditional roots of coal and natural gas and water. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to talk about utilities and how energy gets transferred, there's copper and silver for conductivity. So that's why the stagflation to me is more interesting, because we need these raw materials. We're not ready. Even solar. I mean, solar is a great form of energy, but it is not applicable to plug anything in without actual real electricity. And so... You know, this is this is really where my mind keeps going right now. And I think we're looking at innovation to get past that at some point, but we're nowhere near there at this at, at this moment in time. So unless we go into full recession, because like I said, these sectors just give it up and we find out the consumers are too pinched. The Fed was a little bit too behind the eight ball again in terms of easing up a little bit. You know, I think stagflation is where we're at going into 2025. So if that's the case, Mish, where do you think, you know, we should be allocating capital? Should we just be going, you know, to cash or should we maybe be thinking about like where, where, where should we be going? Well, I think you have to look at it in different pockets. I mean, obviously, commodities and hard assets, which are still so incredibly underinvested, particularly True. in this country. We have the ratio between commodities and equities still at these historic levels. And so if, if the demand for energy turns out to be great and anything else flares up like geopolitics or, you know, we have major storms or the drought continues. Now, India, by the way, the monsoon season, which is really something that they look for, is now not necessarily as robust as they would like. So think about the things that India exports, sugar, you know, I'm always all about sugar and I'm watching that very carefully. I think you have to keep looking at the gold and the silver and the copper. Um, you know, uranium is kind of the new widow maker a little bit, but it's holding up. And then I think you have to keep watching those softs. I mean, people haven't really been talking about coffee, but coffee is definitely expensive and looking like it's getting more expensive. And sugar's always been my key barometer. Because if sugar right now, which is over 19 cents a pound, starts to get back over 20 cents a pound, particularly if we have those issues with India, which is a huge exporter, then we're going back into pockets where you can not only invest but in those areas, but also in the metals as a hedge. But then you've got the energy plays. So I like those. I do. I heard you talking about Palo Alto and cybersecurity. I definitely, I, we've been in Palo Alto for a while and we've taken some money off the table, good money off the table. But now I heard you talking about this 321 level and that's exactly what I'm watching. It's a yeah. possible ad. And then, you know, I still think there are pockets uh, of, of the consumer area that I like. You know, Nike's reporting this week and I think it's going to be a very interesting stock to watch um, because we're going into the Olympics and um, it's possible that that's been really undervalued. You know, I'm still looking at my vanity trade. It may not necessarily be ready to fly, but there are certain stocks that interest me like Ulta and New Skin and Cody. Um, you know, we already know that Elf and Eli Lilly and all the drug companies that have to do with the diet drugs have done well. So I think there are areas you have to pick. And one other area, there was a story today about um, the, the FDA has approved non-tobacco e-cigarettes, flavored e-cigarettes. And that's given a boost to like Altria and Philip Morris. But I'm watching Philip Morris for other reasons. I'm watching Philip Morris because of the fact that um, I think it's going to be a good gateway to determine whether or not cannabis is actually going to go more federal. It's been the biggest political football. And that's kind of, you know, we have our tech stocks, but those are really where my eyes are right now. <laughs> those are nice dividends, too. I mean, if interest rates ever actually know. started going down, these stocks would probably get a lot more love. I know. Because, you know, you fill it more as 5.19%. You're like, well, I get 5% in cash, so why go over there? But, I mean, if all of a sudden we can't get 5% in cash anymore, then... These stocks start to become much more attractive. The Altria, Mish, that dividend has been like eight, 
eight and a half percent here now for a I long know. time, and I've been looking at it too, thinking, man, is it sustainable? Is, is the Altria dividend safe? Well, I believe that they are circling like vultures around the cannabis industry now. What I know for fact is Philip Morris has been involved through a company in Israel in terms of talk about vapes, a vape that's a, from a medical standpoint, gives you an exact dose of what you need as, let's say, a cancer patient. And that's been something. But I also know that they probably, with all this commercial real estate around, are watching very carefully. And I would imagine maybe have some lobbyists going on there as well, because think about it. The cannabis space, I mean, people go, oh, there's so much pot around. That's not going to be a, a big growth area. But I, I don't agree because there's marketing, there's sales, there's distribution, there's packaging. They can make it as sexy as they've made the, the alcohol industry and the tobacco industry, which, of, of course, always has its problems because of addiction. But yeah. they can deal with that as well. And we know if we're going to go into any hard time, let's say we do go more stagflation or even recession. What do people do? They turn to things that make them feel better. So, you know, this is, again, these are all theories of mine. I haven't seen hard evidence yet. But right, let's look at Philip Morris. It's trading between 99 and 103, and it's kind of sitting there. That breaks out. I, I would follow it. Yeah, Altria, Altria too has perked up and looked strong over the past six months, up now 14%. Still underperforming. Uh, well, actually, now at this point that the S&P 500 has come down a little bit, about the same uh, year-to-date, up 10% Altria is. Uh, Mish, before you hopped on, we were talking a little bit about cybersecurity, the increase of hacks. Um, what are you seeing in that space, and which names do you like there? Well, yeah, I mentioned Palo Alto, and I heard you guys talking about it. I've been involved in that stock um, in our discretionary part of our RIA for quite some time now. I bought it after it reported and gapped lower, so at around 277. Yeah. And then before the last report, when it was trading up at 320, I actually took some profit. So I'm holding a partial position, looking to add. You know, it's interesting about Palantir. Everybody talks Palantir. I've, that, that stock has been hyped up as much as one stock can be hyped up and doesn't go anywhere. So I've kind of written that off. I heard you mention CrowdStrike. Um, that would be more of a quant model holding. But for me personally, I would like to add more money into Palantir, particularly as you guys mentioned, if it gets through these triple tops at around this 320, 321 level. I think that's got a huge upside. And yes, yeah, cybersecurity is definitely a thing. No, it's a geopolitical thing. It's just not necessarily, you know, rockets and, and, and bombs, but it is probably much more insidious a way to 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 hurt us it's not just a thing it's everything i mean every company needs to have cybersecurity. i mean it's just not going to go away there's no like oh yeah this is a fad and we don't need cybersecurity. the hackers are just going to say oh we're not going to hack anymore i mean <laughs> so i i mean that's why these valuations you know and, and the valuation on palo alto network has come down from where it was at one time too like you know this used to trade 100 times earnings so, I mean, the company's obviously grown into its valuation to a certain extent. It's still not cheap by any means. I'm just bringing up the trusty Benzinga Pro just to grab the valuation recently. And we're 50 times earnings here. I mean, so it's it's not like cheap, but you're, I don't think you're ever going to get Palo Alto at 20 or 25 times earnings. I just don't think it's going to happen. So, you know, Costco, we talked for years of Costco and it's like 40 times earnings. Well, it's too much. 40 times earnings. Here it is today. It's still 40 times earnings, but it continues to grow and that multiple just continues to stay the same. Sometimes you just got to pay 40 times earnings for good companies. Well, you know, it's so interesting you would bring up, Dennis, valuations, because I, I, I've i been really thinking a lot about that. Um, I'm not necessarily a number cruncher fundamental trader, other than I like the story, the backstory, like we just talked about with, let's say, cannabis, for example. But the valuations are so interesting to me because so much of it is perception and not necessarily the actual valuation. Like, for example, NVIDIA. There are people who really look at this stuff who have been talking to us and telling us, you know, the valuation is still cheap compared to the growth potential of a company like NVIDIA. And so the whole idea of valuation really stems a lot from the momentum and the perception 
of the investors in it. And then when the valuation gets overbought, like you said, or overextended in a, in a company like Costco, does it matter if we're really going into a stagflation environment and people are going to be buying more of the staples? And that's why I keep looking at these other stocks that have been beat up in terms of the vanity, because I think in a recession area, people are still going to want to lose weight and they're still going to want to look good about, feel good about themselves. But yeah, valuation is really, it's a, it's a, it's a very scientific thing, but it's also a very emotional thing. Two things before I let you go, Mish, and one uh, being on the subject of, uh, of in uh, you know, take your profits on these things. I mean, do you go, do you have certain technical indicators of uh, that you follow? Is it uh, just boom, price, price base, like percentage base? Because, you know, looking at NVIDIA now here, you pull back, you hit 140, Mike Brown earnings go up. How do, how do you bait? Because, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to get in and it's a lot harder to get out. How do you look at, at something like NVIDIA and some of these other tech stocks that have had big runs? Well, essentially, if I want to make it really simple and fast, so what we do is we look at the average true range of a particular instrument. So certain things have a 20 cent range and certain things have a $14 range. It really depends on the volatility of that particular instrument. So if we look at NVIDIA, <clears throat> when we first get in, we probably do not want to risk more than about two or three times the ATR of any particular instrument. With our quants, we've kind of rounded it off more to about 15% risk. And then in terms of the profit taking, it depends. If you're a discretionary trader, what we might do is raise the stop to no loss once we get two times the ATR in profit. And then we start looking at taking actual profits as we get to four times the ATR, six times the ATR, eight times the ATR. And a lot of this depends on, of course, the market condition. In the last bull run, it's been easier to wait for those parameters and we keep peeling and then eventually we'll have a tail. If we get a decent correction, we might add back in, but otherwise we'll hold the tail with some kind of a trailing stop. So that keeps you in the game. But at the same time, when you get a turnaround like in NVIDIA, we actually took a fourth profit target last week. And now with a dip, the quants might be willing to get back in, provided that we still have the trend strength indicator looking well. So that's that's quant language. But from a discretionary standpoint, I'm much simpler. I took my profits in Palantir as I started to get four or five times what my original investment was in ATR. And now I have my tail. It's very, very generous. And now I'm looking to add because that's a good momentum stock. So there's art and there's science. I like that. All right, one more before I let you go. Uh, quad Witch Explorations, you've seen a few. Dennis and I have seen a few. Uh, boy, oh boy, kind of real choppy action. You had that $87 trillion unwind. Uh, turned out to be pretty choppy here. I look at this as a very important week in the market. I look at the closing price from the S&Ps, you know, on Friday. And I also, you have the end of the quarter uh, coming, uh, you know, very quickly here. What, 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 from your experience in the markets and the quad witches expirations and stuff, what are a few key factors that you're going to be keeping an eye on this week, either technical or fundamental? Well, I started out by saying, I know we've had a lot of words since then, is I'm really, really, really watching those areas, the inside sectors. We want to really see what's going on here in the U.S. economy. And AI is great. Like you said, you know, future, oh, my God, it's going to save the world, blah, 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 has its issues. But we're still an economy that's based on companies that operate in the U.S., consumers that have to go shopping, transportations that have to move goods, and the regional banks that are definitely dealing with the very nuanced real estate area and those are what i'm watching if they hold and money's attracted soft landing comes okay. back on the table if not i then i think we we're going to have a much bigger sell-off and 5400 will break easily in the spy me schneider chief market strategist for market gauge giving us a fundamental technical outlook on the markets always great to hear your cheerful voice and uh, we will be down you up again real soon Thank you guys so much. Have a great day.